One of the things that you have to do in life sometimes, and I think there have been times in my life that I didn't do it and I wish I had, was to speak up, to step out of the crowd, to be counted. Times that I knew I should have done it, but I didn't. And what you're going to see in the passage we're going to look at this weekend are two people who, out of desperation, really, stepped out of the crowd and they confronted Jesus in their point of weakness, in their point of need. And unless we come to a place with Jesus where we say, I am in desperate need right now, you're my only hope. We'll never find the healing, and we'll never find the hope, and we'll never find the forgiveness that only he can give us. And so this is what this this story, this event in the life of Jesus is all about. So I would love you to follow along, because in our passage, I think it's going to be, it's Mark chapter 5, we're going to start at verse 21. And uh, it's not, if you don't have a Bible, we have these chair Bibles, and on page 816, you can follow along with me um, as I read through it. So the story, I'll just, as you're turning there, let me just give you an overview. So the story is about a man, he's a prominent man, he comes to Jesus, and he says, my daughter is on her deathbed, and only you, I, I believe you're the only one that can heal her. And, uh, and he, so Jesus, he says, would you come and heal her? And so as Jesus is on the way, he's interrupted, and he just stops. He's, he's mobbed by the crowds, they're all over him. And he says, who touched me? <laughs> Have you ever been in a, a, a crowd where you're bumping into people? And Well, it, it, it's kind of absurd that he would say this. And, and so that's kind of where the passage is. Up to this point, here's what Mark has done. Mark has shown us that Jesus is over the, the nature. He's over the storm. That They're out on a boat. There's this great storm that comes, and Jesus calms the storm. Uh, We looked uh, last weekend where Mark talked about uh, these uh, demonic demons and and how Jesus cast these demons out. And it says Jesus is over the demonic, the the spirit world. And then this weekend we're going to see how Mark wants us to see. Because see, this is all Mark helping us to understand who Jesus is. And so this weekend what he's going to do, he's going to show us that Jesus is over disease and he's over death. So each time Mark is saying, I want you to know the power of who you're, we're dealing with and who, who, we're, who this is. So Mark chapter 5, verse 21, I think that's a good intro and we can follow along now. When Jesus had crossed uh, over by boat again to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him and he was at, while he was by the lake. And then one of the synagogue later, leaders named Jairus came and he said, saw Jesus and he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly him, with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all that she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding around you, against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet. Notice he's doing the same thing that Jairus did falling at his feet, trembling with fear, and told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? It's too late. Now, it doesn't say that, but essentially that's what they're saying. Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, 
don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John. That's the inner circle of Jesus, the brother of James. Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. Well, she is dead. And I think the point that Jesus is making here is she's going to be awake in a moment. They all laughed at him. After he put them out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him, Peter, James, and John he's referring to. He went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about it. He told them to give her something to eat. I think it was macaroni and cheese because they love that, right? So there's three lessons we want to draw from this passage. The first one is this. It's one thing to know about Jesus. It's another thing to know Jim, know him. Um, there was a crowd that knew Jesus. They believed he was a real historical person. They believed he could perform miracles. They believed he could cast out demons. They, they believed that Jesus had power in him. There was no question about him. They were following him because he was doing all these great things. If you read a little further, you're going to see that many people are dragging the, the sick by him. They're, they're grabbing onto his garment, hoping to be healed. This is, so so they, they all knew that Jesus had healing power. Uh, so many of them are touching Jesus that day. There's a mob around him. They're bumping him. They're touching him. Uh, the woman thought, though, she said, well, if I can just touch the cloak of his garment and get away, I believe I could be healed by him. And um, the, the, the description of her condition was she had an issue of blood. And what they, scholars believe was she had continual menstrual bleeding for 12 years. It says that she had been to many doctors and they brought her no relief. In fact, she got worse. I don't know if, you've, you know, if that's a tell of the doctors of those days. It says that she spent all that she had. Every dime that she had, she went... And to no avail for, tw for, for, for 12 years. Interesting, we have 12-year-old in 12 years, right? And she found no relief at all. And uh, it's amazing that Jesus turns his attention to this woman. In the midst of, you know, it's, it's kind of like this. It's like Jairus comes, the synagogue leader, and he says, My daughter is on her deathbed. Please come and help her. Keep, please heal her. And so he's, it's like an ambulance, like Jesus is the ambulance. And then they, the ambulance stops, and Jesus gets out of the ambulance and says, whose car is that over there? <laughs> it's, it's illegally parked or something. It's like, the, the, you know, I mean, this is what's going on. He's, Jesus is heading to a, death, a girl's deathbed, and he stopped because somebody touched his garment. So uh, this woman has zero social, economic, capital, or power and he treats, their, treats her, he stops in the middle of an emergency, he stops, and he, he treats her as there's nothing more important in the world than this woman right here and now. Can you imagine that? Have you ever gotten lost in the place where you think, oh, God is so big and I'm so small, he doesn't care about me. He doesn't know what's going on. He's too busy for me, right? Here's an example where Jesus is pretty busy. Got an emergency. He stops and he turns and he says, who touched me? I think that's what God does for each one of his sons and daughters. Her condition made her unclean. And so to the point that as you read the Old Testament law, Exodus and Leviticus, uh, anybody who had blood issues or different situations like that was considered unclean, and they were required to 
remained separate from the population because they would make this person, anybody that they came in contact with, ceremonially unclean so that they couldn't go to the temple, they couldn't offer sacrifices, they couldn't worship God. And so they had, and in fact, they had to say unclean, unclean, unclean so that people would separate because if you touched a person who was unclean, you became unclean for a period of time. Now, sometimes we read these Old Testament laws, and we go, I don't get it. I don't understand it. It seems like they're so picky, and they get all bent out of shape about things. And I was thinking about that, and I was thinking, so essentially what the Exodus and Leviticus laws were, they were about blood being shared or people getting contaminated through blood. And I was thinking, do we care about that today? If you've ever been to a basketball game and a kid gets a, a gash on his face or a, no, a, a nose broken and there's blood on the floor. What do you see happen? You see the trainer come out with gloves and like <laughs> this caustic cleaner wiping the floor and getting every little and the ref will say, no, there's a spot there, no, there's a spot there. And, and they're cleaning it all up, right? Why? Because contaminated blood can kill you. We know that today, don't we? They didn't know that back then. We know it today. Do you know what the number one killer of animals, the, 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 the number one killer of human beings, of animals is? Mosquito. Malaria and all these other diseases come through mosquitoes. Transferring blood, tainted blood. It may be that uh, back, way back then, God knew to protect his people, he had to separate people who had tainted blood. And so, uh, just my take on it. So Jesus, um, he knew immediately somebody in the crowd had touched him. And there were, it, it, you know, the disciples are right. Come on, what are you, are you kidding me? People are bumping into you, they're touching you. It, 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 you would have, you'd be better to ask, who hasn't touched him? Because he might have a, 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 a smaller uh, pool of people. But notice the interesting thing is that it says that Jesus felt the power go out of him. It's very important that you understand this. The power didn't go through Jesus. Jesus wasn't a channel of the healing power of God. Jesus, the power came. He wasn't a middleman, in other words. He is Almighty God. He is the healer. The power was within him. He wasn't a channel of power. And so he stops walking. He calls out to the crowd for the person to come forward. And the disciples, are, uh, they're, they're baffled. And the woman only wanted to be healed. She thought she'd get in, touch the cloak, get out. That's what she thought. And as she's running away or walking away very quickly, Jesus, I think, knew it was her. And as you read the Greek, you kind of give it an idea that it's, he knew it was the woman and she comes and she tells him what happened. She falls at his feet and she explains her healing. Remember, she's gone, this has gone on for 12 years. This has been an issue in her life. And she's immediately healed. Now here's, here's what is going on here. She is going to Jesus because all she really wants is to be physically healed. But Jesus would have none of it. He wants all of her. He wants to have a relationship with her. He wants not just to heal her. You see, there's a great deal of difference between being a semi-superstitious person who gets physical healing because they have touched the cloak and being transform, a transformed disciple of Jesus because he has invited you into his relationship with him. That's what he's looking for for everyone in this room, everyone online, everyone at whatever campus, whether at Kennedy or Roshek or online. Jesus doesn't just want to heal you. He wants to have a relationship with you. But Jesus bids her to come and have a life-transforming relationship. The point is, and the interesting point is, instead of the woman making Jesus unclean, which she would by touching him, Jesus makes the woman clean. And he commends her for her faith, and he gives her a blessing, and he affirms her as she leaves. He calls her his daughter. What is interesting here is she stepped out of the crowd and she's found not just physical healing, but she's found spiritual forgiveness. 
She got more than she ever dreamed. She thought, if I could just be physically healed, and Jesus said, but then one day you'll die. And so Jesus gave her more than she bargained for, more than she asked for, but everything that she needed. Here's, here's what I want you to hear. God didn't send his son from heaven to earth merely to be, bring physical healing to you and to me. Now, there's nothing wrong with asking him for healing, but sometimes that's all that people want from, out of God. Is it just, just heal me physically. Just, just pay my bills. Just do this. He wants to have a life transformational relationship with us. And Jesus commands an all or nothing from us. You're either all in or you're not in at all. And Jesus said this often. He says, come, follow me. And many people said, no, I've got this. He says, well, let the dead bury the dead. God didn't come, God didn't send his son to make your life better, to make you happy. He sent Jesus to die for your sins that separate you from him. He sent Jesus Christ uh, to close the gap, be, the gaping hole between heaven and earth due to our sin and rebellion. Jesus is not an ad, ad additional uh, accessory that we add to our lives. He is the son of God, the savior of all who step out of the crowd by faith. One of the things this woman did was she stepped out of the crowd and she said, I need to be healed. And she came to Jesus by faith. Now, many people touched Jesus that day, but only one stepped out of the crowd and found Jesus, found healing and forgiveness. And there needs to be a, a moment in our lives where we individually step out of the crowd and say, Jesus, I'm not just part of the crowd. I don't just believe you existed. I don't just believe you lived a life. I don't just believe you're a miracle worker or a great teacher. I believe that you're my only hope and you're my only Savior. I believe there's a point where we have to step out of the crowd and make that com confession. Because it says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, it says that uh, many will say to Jesus, Jesus says this in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and drive out demons in your name and perform many miracles? And I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. I never knew you. We never had a relationship. You never stepped out of the crowd. You never came to a place where you said, I need a Savior. I'm lost. I'm helpless. I'm hopeless. You know, it's interesting because... Uh, some people today, especially in our culture, say, well, I believe in Jesus, and I think he's a great guy, and I think, uh, you know, I, I, I like him a lot. The question I want to ask you is, what's, what's different than your faith and demon faith? Do you, do you think demons believe in Jesus? Yes. Do they believe he heals? Yes. Do they believe that, they, they, that he can cast them out of people? Yes. Do they, do, do they believe that he is the son of God, the, 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 the second person of the Trinity? Yes. Do they believe all those things? Absolutely. But they don't trust. They don't follow. They don't see him as Lord. They have another Lord. And that's why Jesus' brother says this in James chapter 2, Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that, and they shudder. says, and they shudder. So my question to you is, is your faith any deeper, different than demon faith? This woman stepped out of the crowd, and she put her faith in Jesus. And essentially what she was saying is, I've tried doctors. I've tried everything. Jesus, you're my last hope. It's almost like what the thief on the cross did. There were two thieves on the cross. One stayed in the crowd. He kept chiding Jesus and uh, making fun of Jesus. The other one said, hey, you know, we deserve to be here because we, we committed crimes. And he says to Jesus, he, he, he kind of reaches out and touches the cloak of Jesus. He doesn't, but, you know, he he says, Jesus, remember me when you get to paradise. What is he doing there? He's placing his faith in Jesus. Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Here's the second uh, lesson that we learned from this. The key to real faith is not the amount, but the focus. 
I think every one of us in, in this room and watching uh, whatever campus, whether it's online or one of the campuses, I think most of us would say, I just feel like uh, my faith isn't deep enough. It's, it's, I don't have enough of it. I lack faith. And, and you know, I, I don't, yeah. But, but here's the thing about faith. I think we worry too much about how much faith we have rather than worrying about where are we placing our faith? Where are we directing it? See, the, 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 real, the key to real faith is not the amount, but the focus. We, we've forgotten, too, in the story, because we've been talking about the one, we forgot about the little girl. What about the little girl, right? Wasn't that the beginning of the story? The, the synagogue leader comes to Jesus, and he says, my daughter is sick. The woman was suffering, but the girl's dying, right? This is, you know, the, the woman has a chronic problem, but this uh, little girl has an acute problem. She's about to die. So as Jesus is giving a blessing to this uh, woman, bad news comes in the form of, uh, and we find the little girl died. And notice what Jesus says. It's very interesting what he says. He says to her, don't be afraid, just believe. Don't be afraid, just believe. Now, as you read the, the underlying Greek text there, it's the present imperative. And the present tense in the Greek language means Jesus is saying something more than that. He's saying, he's saying essentially, don't be afraid, just keep trusting, keep trusting, keep believing, keep believing. It's an ongoing future. He's, in other words, don't stop believing, continue believing, don't give up. Essentially what he's saying is don't give up yet. Now, he, he's just gotten, and, and he, the messengers are saying, Gee, you know, don't, the, it's, it's too late. Don't bother the master. It's a waste of the time. Jesus says, no, it's not. Don't give up yet. Don't give up. And, uh, Jesus is literally saying, keep on believing, don't give up. Um, Jairus uh, is very different than the woman. The woman's at the bottom of the societal, uh, financial uh, uh, of society. She's at the bottom. Jairus is at the top. He's one of the synagogue leaders. He's prominent and powerful and respected, and he is a desperate father. When he first came to Jesus, he fell at his feet, and he pleaded for his daughter's life. He stepped out of the crowd out of desperation. He realized that Jesus, like the woman, was his only hope. They come to his house, and Jesus is met, and the rest of them are met by professional mourners. We don't get that in our culture, but you would hire people that would play instruments, and they would, you know, wail, and uh, the more mourners you had, the more, uh, you know, they, so they, it was profession, you know, your profession, your business card would say professional mourner. And so Jesus walks in, he hears all the ruckus, and um, he leaves everyone out, outside. He brings Peter, James, and John. He brings Jarius and his wife, and, and the, they go into the room with a little girl. And everyone else is outside. It says, in, it's, it's so powerful and so tender what Jesus does here. He sits down next to the little girl. He takes her hand, and he speaks softly to her. And we see the, we see the, the, the power and gentleness of Jesus. Those of you that have had little children, and when they're asleep, and you're trying to wake them up in the morning, you sit down next on their bed, and you may touch their arm or grab their hand, and you just rustle them ever so gently, and you say, honey, honey, time to get up. Time to get up, right? You've done that, right? And they, oh, and they're kind of, oh, hi. Yeah, it's time to get up. That's exactly what the language says. Jesus, Jesus grabbed her hand and said, honey, it's time to get up. It's time to get up. And, and she does. She wakes up. Now, did the father have a lot of faith? He had some. How about the disciples? Well, we're not even told that they had faith. How about the little girl? She's dead. <laughs> kind of hard to have faith there. But uh, the, the little faith that the father had that was directed and focused on Jesus was enough. And that's the point I want you to see. Don't get all bogged down that you don't have enough faith. Just make sure your faith is focused on Jesus. 
Faith is not about how much you have. It's about where you're directing it. Too many people, and here's the thing, too many people put their faith on themselves. There are many people that are going to stand before Jesus one day and say, Jesus, I deserve to be in heaven. Look at my resume. i got a great resume here. And Jesus says, your faith is in yourself. What you didn't realize is you needed a Savior. That's why I came from heaven to earth. You need to put your faith in me. See, we all have faith. The question is, where are we placing it? Who are we trusting? Are we trusting Jesus? The woman stepped out of the crowd and placed her faith in Jesus. Jairus stepped out of the crowd and placed his faith in Jesus. That's why the writer of Hebrews says, Without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So the, the second thing I want you to see is not how much faith you have, it's where you place your faith. So don't beat yourself up over you don't have enough faith. I love the one phrase, and we're going to get to it, where the man comes and Jesus basically says, don't you believe? He says, I believe, help my unbelief. <laughs> and that's where I am sometimes, aren't you? I believe, help my unbelief. I'm trying, but I don't really have this figured out yet. And that's okay, because Jesus doesn't, doesn't condemn him for that. Here's the third thing that I want you to see. He lost his life so that we could find ours. Mark wants us to know that Jesus has the power over creation. He's already showed us that. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago where Jesus calmed this raging storm. The disciples were, the boat was swamped. They're ready to go down. And Jesus calms the wind and the waves with a word. And we pointed back to creation where Jesus spoke and it was. He is over the spirit world. There's no spiritual force or power or person that can stand against you. If you know Jesus Christ, there's no spiritual force or power or person that can stand against you. No one. And then number three, he wants us to know that he is over disease and death. And we saw that today. We see how he's over disease and how he healed this woman in a moment, in a moment, just just instantaneously it says that he felt the power go through him out of him and then over death we see him taking the hand of the daughter and saying honey honey wake up wake up he is the only one who can bring healing and hope but who do you identify with in in this passage maybe you identify with a woman and I, I just want you to understand that Jesus doesn't just want to heal you physically or emotionally. He wants to heal you spiritually. He wants to have a relationship with you. We sometimes ask for too little. What Jesus wants is all of us. He doesn't want a part of us. He doesn't want to get a, He doesn't want us to fit us in where where we can. He wants our whole life. He wants a relationship with us. He wants you to live forever with him in loving relationship. And what I think too many people are asking for is they're saying, God, I just want you to give me physical healing for this situation that I'm in the middle of. And Jesus is saying, I want you to live forever with me in heaven. Because if I just, feel, if I just heal you physically, it's just, I'm just delaying the inevitable. Maybe you identify with Jarius. And you have faith, but your days, seems, your days seem like they're getting darker. And just picture Jesus looking to you. you just imagine Jairus when he gets this news that not, not only is your daughter not just sick, she's dead. And there's no reason to even bring the master anymore. All hope is gone. And Jesus looks at Jairus and he says, keep on trusting me. I won't let you down. Don't give up yet. He says, don't be afraid. Just believe. Even if there's a delay, trust that Jesus is in control and he has a plan, even when it looks like he doesn't. Maybe you identify with Jarius, 
and you're in a situation right now where you're ready to give up hope because all, the only news you get is bad news. The only darkness, you, you, you don't see any light, you just see darkness. And I said, as I said a couple of weeks ago, look for Jesus in the darkness because he's there. He promises, I will be with you. I think we all need to identify with a little girl because one day we're all going to die. The good news is that when we trust We put our faith in Jesus. One day we will hear his voice and he will say to us, he'll take us by the hand and he'll say, honey, buddy, it's time to get up. It's time to get up. We all need to realize that unless Jesus raises us to life, we're dead. I want to just talk for just a minute so one of the phrases that I was really struggling with this week was this one. And I asked my son, Kyle, I was talking to Carol a little bit about it. And the phrase, after the woman touched his cloak, it says, and Jesus realized the power had gone from him. The power had gone from him. And I thought it was an odd phrase. I said, why, why does Mark put that in there? He didn't have to. He could have just said, and he, Jesus realized that somebody touched him. And we're healed. I mean, he could have said that, but he, he didn't. The power. He mentions the power going out of him. That Jesus felt a transfer going out. And as far as I know, this is the only time in the New Testament that it ever says anything like this. So I thought it was such a strange phrase. And I wrestled with it all week. And, and I don't really have an answer other than to say that there is a point where power has to leave Jesus for our healing. In the end, the power had to go out of Jesus for our healing. In fact, uh, life went out of him on the cross. He, when he uttered his last word, it is finished, everything went out of him. He lost it all. He lost all power. He lost v- his very life for you and for me. And so in a small way, he said power left him. He knew the power left him. On the cross, everything, life itself left him. On, in the end, on the cross, the power went out of Jesus, all of it. He died for you and for me, he gave his life for me and for you. Because he lost all power, he gave his life so that we could live, not just now, but forever. Mark is showing us that when Jesus has us by the hand, even death itself is nothing but a good night's sleep. Even death itself can only make me better. If Jesus has us by the hand, I have his power helping me and watching over me. And Jesus willingly gave up all power and life so that we could live. I don't know where you're at this weekend, but I do know this. There has to be a moment where you step out of the crowd and you say, Jesus, I don't want to be part of the crowd that believes in you, that says, rah, rah, Jesus, I want to have a relationship with you. I want to know you. I want to walk with you. I want to just not just call you Savior, but I want to call you Lord of my life. There needs to be a point where you say, Jesus, I need you and you're my only hope. I'm Jarius and I need healing. I'm the woman and I need healing. I'm the little girl and I need resurrection. Jesus, you're my only hope. I'm a sinner and I'm, I'm separated from you. You are my only hope. I am stepping out of the crowd and I'm calling out to you and I'm asking you to come into my life and to save me, to forgive me, to, to give me life. You don't get it unless you step out of the crowd. Jesus says, many will say to me on that day, hey, we were part of the crowds. We saw you. We believed in you. We, we even did some of your miracles. And Jesus said to them, I don't know you. Unless you step out of the crowd and you say, Jesus, I right now am asking you to come into my life and to save my soul, to give me life and to build build a relationship with you. I want to have a relationship with you. I want to know you. Until we come to that point, we're still part of the crowd. Let's pray. 
Help us, Father, to take something from your word tonight, this weekend, to understand the ramifications for our individual life. I pray that if there are people who are still in the crowd, they've never stepped out by faith, they've never crossed that line of faith, they've never called upon Jesus as Savior. They're trusting in themselves, and they're trusting in uh, uh, a belief system that they were raised in. But tonight, this weekend, they've come to a place where they realize that Jesus is the only way to the Father, the only way to life. That power went out of him. Life went out of him. He gave his life so that we could live. He took our sin so that we could be forgiven. He took the wrath that we deserved. And Father, they may want to pray a prayer like this. Dear Father, I thank you that you sent Jesus to save me, to pay the price for my sin, to take the wrath that I deserved. And now as he gave his life for me and gave, gave power went out of him, I give my life to him. And I not only call him my Savior, I ask him to become more and more Lord of my life from day to day to day. May my faith always be directed in Jesus and not myself, not a tradition, not a church. And may I know you more and more in the days and the weeks to come. And Father, if somebody prayed that prayer, I pray they'd let somebody know for the rest of us, Father, who may have prayed a prayer like that, we stepped out of the crowd a while ago, maybe recently or years ago. May we understand that you are with us, that you love us, that you're never too busy for us, that there are no emergencies that keep you from us, that we can always come into your presence, not because we deserve to, but because we've been granted an extreme privilege to do that. For that, we are so grateful. We are so thankful. May we be glorified in our lives. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.